Here we go. Welcome, everyone. You are here for Perspectives from the Trail, Land Management in the Era of the Blue Dots. Maggie came up with that title. I think it's very good. Um, so what we have in store for you today is we have, um, a, we have a panel here of land managers from Utah. We'll have them introduce themselves. And it's an opportunity to really have that land manager conversation with mappers, um, with uh, app providers. And I think it'll be really interesting. I'll kind of kick off some questions, but I think really letting the audience too and have some dialogue. And um, we've had some great ones. Yeah, Diane's got a, got a mic. We do want to use the mics, even though we're small, we want to use the mics because we are recording. So uh, if we don't use them, it'll be hard for people in the future. You know what we said. Um, so, okay. With that, um, and there we go. Yeah, I need those two nowadays. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get down off of here. That kind of felt good, though. I might want to stay up there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I need that, though, sometimes. Okay, so, oh, I should introduce myself. Um, I am TJ Broom. Um, my day job is working for the uh, Forest Service, um, and I have been representing the Forest Service on the Trails Working Group um, that OpenStreetMap US has been hosting for the last three years, um, and so involved in this work, and not a lot of you last year or here and um, been having great conversations. I'm excited for this one. A lot of them have been around data and apps and whatnot. And now we get to talk to the folks that are like really on the ground who have the people out there with the recreating public doing their thing and, um, and kind of noticing things going on that are maybe different in the past. And especially with that um, recreation was increasing pre-COVID, which is great. And we all know during COVID, um, it exploded exponentially, and there is now data to show that. And um, that was, I mean, also great in different ways, but um, it was a lot for the agencies, to be honest, to manage that. And um, and then with that, you know, the nature of how people get their information, how they get to places has been changing, has changed, and we're in a new world. So yeah, we'll talk to some people. And so how about we have you guys introduce yourselves, kind of what your job is, what you work with, and then, um, and then I'll kind of kick off a first question after that. But so, yeah, Larry, you wanna, and here, I'll give you this. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't get that one to work, so. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, yeah, you guys can hear me? Good. <laughs> hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just really excited to be here. And, um, you know, I think we probably started this effort, or at least when I got involved, TJ was probably about a year, year and a half ago. Um, but I'm Larry Velarde. I'm the Trails Dispersed Recreation and Travel Management Program Manager for the Intermountain Region, Region 4, uh, which consists of 12 national forests, uh, roughly 60 ranger districts. Uh, five, we have five forests in Utah, five national forests in Southern Idaho, uh, Humboldt, Toyabe in Nevada, and the Bridge of Teton in, in Wyoming. Uh, during the height of uh, the summer field season, and that includes uh, all crews, not just recreation crews, but fire crews as well. We have about 5,500 employees that work, uh, that work here in, in the region. So uh, I travel quite a bit uh, to go out and help with uh, trails projects, uh, any dispersed recreation uh, issues, and especially since COVID, uh, that's, it's been a huge issue, and any travel management issues. And so uh, this discussion um, that uh, and the discussions that you've been having the last uh, couple of days and getting accurate, good information uh, on our maps is really going to help us uh, a lot. I know we're going to dive into that here shortly, so I won't go too much uh, in depth on, on that, but it's really important to our land management uh, agencies, whether it be BLM, whether it be the Park Service, uh, the Forest Service, uh, any of our state um, uh, partners that managed land out there where we uh, work very closely, at least I do, uh, with Idaho Parks and, and Recreation. They do a lot of work for us out there, both in the non-motorized and motorized world, and then also with Utah Division of Outdoor Recreation here, here in Utah. And so uh, we have good relationships, good partnerships uh, with all those folks, and uh, we definitely want that with the, with the MAP community as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carrie. Great, thanks, Larry. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm probably going to give you a little bit more in-depth background about myself than than Larry did, just to kind of explain why I'm here. But I think I grew up in uh, Gunnison, Colorado. Um, my dad and family owned and operated a guide and outfitting business, so I started at a very 
young age, being on public lands and using trails and wilderness and Forest Service, BLM, Park Service. Um, and I think a, a fun story, I, I remember very distinctly as a, as a kid going out behind our house, which was BLM land and, and building bike trails. And, and a lot of those trails kind of today still exist, but now they're designated trails. So I, I think that played really well into my future career, which started out in the park service. So I did seven years as a law enforcement backcountry park ranger for Canyonlands National Park down in the Needles District, if anyone's ever been there. But super beautiful, awesome, inspiring place. Um, a lot of really great cultural resources, um, great cultural landscape. Um, and I think that's where, you know, being a backcountry park ranger there, a lot of us that were working on the ground started to recognize, you know, with these apps coming out that people were following these off-trail routes and we would find them out there and they were confused by the fact that their app showed a trail. And when they showed up, there was no trail on the ground. And so we started looking at it and we're like, well, you're right. And not only was it these off-trail routes, but a lot of the archeological sites that are in like say Salt Creek, which is a very important cultural district of, of Canyonlands National Park, had trails on the map going to them, which you know is great if you wanna know where an archeological site is as a visitor, but for a land manager, we're trying to protect those places and protect those resources. And so when we saw trails on a map that looked official or, or designated, and people were using them, it became concerning because then you get people going out to these cultural sites that um, are not hardened or protected in any way. Um, certainly we want people to see them, um, but we don't necessarily want that advertised on a map as this is you know, here for you to go to. And unless we as land managers put something into it to protect it on the ground. So that kind of started a conversation amongst myself and my colleagues um, in the Southeast Utah group, which is Arches and Canyonlands, National Parks, um, Natural Bridges, and Hoban Week National Monuments, which again are butting up against what's now Bears Ears National Monument, which I think we all have probably heard about that in the media, but it's a huge cultural landscape that is being protected in, under the Antiquities Act because, because of all these antiquities, right? So it was something we were discussing um, about, okay, how could we maybe work with whoever's responsible for these apps? And we didn't know at the time it was OSM. We just had this in the back of our mind and um, got to exploring and we saw it was, was open street maps. And so funny enough, I reached out to Maggie, um, didn't know it was Maggie at the time, but right, sent, it, sent an email and just said, these are our concerns, here's what's happening. And she wrote back and she's like, well, great. Do you want to present to us and let us know what you're seeing? And well, I don't know if I'm the best qualified for that, but I'm going to give it a go. And so I put a presentation together and um, that started out the uh, trail stewarded stewardship initiative and, and Mappy Hour working groups. And um, I think, uh, you know, several years later or years later, I took the leap and transitioned over to the Bureau of Land Management out of the Moab field office. And so unfortunately kind of fell out of the loop on that just because the BLM Moab field office is is very intense and, and busy and kept me busy in different ways than um, working with, with mapping, but um, kind of fell back into it again recently and, and am super excited to be here because I'm finding just all of this dialogue and this talk here today is so, important and so pertinent to what we do with the BLM, um, all federal land management agencies, but the BLM in the Moab field office where I'm now an outdoor recreation planner. Um, I will say just to kind of finish off the conversation because I've heard a lot here today about, you know, the, B the land management agencies can't manage all of this data on our own and it's very accurate, right? We, we just don't have the capacity. I mean, um, the Moab Field Office has 41 campgrounds we're managing, which has 170 toilets that we have to take care of. Um, so we have very, we have what, five maintenance employees and I guess eight park rangers, but over 1.8 million acres with 3 million visitors a year. So, you know, to say that we're gonna sit down and, and look at all this data and add 
appropriate tags and information to it is, is certainly um, a big ask and, and not going to happen in the reality of it on the ground. Um, and that's where I found it very interesting moving over to the BLM because we have an amazing county and, and partnerships that we work with through the county. And um, I do want to point out they're here today. It's, um, our representatives from our Grand County Active Transportation and Trails who, who really are responsible for getting that information about the Moab area public lands out to people and so we can't do it as land management agencies without those type of partnerships. Um, and I think just the fact that I'm here and Maddie and Anna are here today, I think just represents that we really want to work on this and get work with you all to get good information out to the people who are visiting our public lands for all the reasons that we've heard, right? For safety, for resource protection, for just the experience of the visitors themselves. So I think, super, again, super excited to be here and, and look forward to hopefully giving you my perspective on any questions you might have. Hey, Carrie, I think it, maybe this is too detailed, but I just want to know more about how did you find out that it was the open street map data? Like, and, and connect, like you kind of said you got a hold of me, but how did that happen? Um, and what's your sense of, like, say, other people in your agency and their awareness of open street map? And yeah, and then I might ask you kind of the same thing, Larry. I might. No, that's a great question, TJ, because um, so. <laughs> We just looked at the map, right? We looked at the map and we saw open street map at the bottom. That that's the that's the truth, right? Um, and then we started Googling open street map and I was like, well, I don't know anything about OSM, um, but I see an email address here and, that, and that's where it started from, right? And then and then we started digging into it and learning more about OSM and then we were starting to go in and doing some of our own edits and that sort of thing. So um, you know, to be honest, I, I don't think there's much knowledge at all of what OSM is in, in in the BLM, at least certainly not from the perspective of being more on the ground. Um, I mean, I feel like in my field office, I'm probably the only one that actually understands what OSM is, right? And, and, and my understanding still is growing, right? Like I'm learning more every time that I um, come to something like this or, um, you know, seek out the information. So, um, you know, and, and I thought a good um, representation of that is we were at a trail conference in Vernal um, a few weekends back and Maggie was there and gave a, a presentation and there was someone in the room that um, when she was talking about just, you know, the three people running OSM and that it's all open source and how vast it is and I, I can't remember the exact quote but someone in the room was like, are you kidding me? Like, mind blown. Like, we had no idea what this is. So, um, no, I think it's a great question. And, and I that's where I'm hoping, you know, we can kind of start to help our agencies understand exactly what's out there, what the initiatives are, even just things like all trails and, and the public land program and just understanding that and understanding the conversations that are happening here because I'm, I'm being enlightened just by one session this afternoon of just what's out there. Yeah, and then Larry, I'm gonna frame it up this way for you. So, you know, you work and support trail managers that are managing trail systems on national forests and districts, and they have seasonal employees that are out there and they're doing that. They're also interacting with the public and educating them, helping them find out, you know, again, um, for how OpenStreetMap plays in, like, when, when did you learn about it? And what's your sense of those people on the ground that are helping provide that recreation information? They're seeing people carry the, they're getting their information from sources. What's the sense out there of kind of from the units? So TJ, I think I mentioned uh, earlier, I probably started to get engaged uh, and this is just a little bit before you you uh, you started uh, leading this charge for us. Um, so that's about a year and a half ago. And open street maps, I really didn't know what that was about. Um, our field going personnel, I really don't know. To be honest with you, uh, I haven't I haven't, I haven't really uh, talked to any of those folks about um, the uh, minus the Uinta Wasatch Cache. I think they have a I think they have a pretty good idea. 
Uh, I would venture a guess with, uh, with the youngness of our seasonal employees that come on board, anywhere from 18 to 25 years old, they probably have a good sense. Uh, but I haven't asked that question. That is one question that I, that I have not uh, uh, asked. Uh, I know that, um, and I think I joked about this, Maggie, when we first uh, started meeting here about six, eight months ago, um, I don't even use the apps. I still use seven and a half minute quads. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, but when I'm hunting with my son and and uh, and my son-in-law and their and their friends, you know, they're they're all pulling out their phones, and I just I just follow them. So I'm just really really uh, learning uh, about this. Um, didn't really engage. Uh, I know that some of my colleagues across the uh, across the regions uh, probably have been engaged in this uh, more more than I, and they know data more than more than I do. Uh, but I am excited uh, again to, to, to really get this going because um, Maggie just talked about that. And we've been uh, really for me, uh, I think for the, for the folks on the ground, um, you know, we definitely want to provide that public access, right? That's what we're about. These are national forest system lands that are managed by the Forest Service. They don't belong to the Forest Service. They're not owned by the Forest Service. They are for public use public access that is that is a key piece that uh i have really made um tj maggie and and the rest of the group uh, aware and that we need to share that information uh with with everybody i hate it when the media comes out and say forest service owned lands we see that all the time we see that in the salt lake tribune we see that in the desert news we see that in usa today um safety key key component safety um, accurate info and data, uh, and that, that leads to that safety piece and to that public access. Uh, addressing, addressing unauthorized routes, as we call them in the Forest Service, right? Uh, because when, with the different app, app companies out there uh, that are putting information, uh, and you're pulling it up on your phone, and you see a trail on there, and it's really not a trail. It looks like a trail because they pushed it so far with, with especially motorized vehicles. Right, uh, so you don't you, you don't know the difference, but uh, but for me that, that that's a big one. We started a campaign here on the Heber Camas Ranger District about three years ago with Tread Lightly, and we actually had a dispersed recreation travel management crew that was working with Tread Lightly closing unauthorized routes. It's it's an incredible program, uh, and we're trying to spread that through the through the rest of the region with Tread Lightly. Uh, stewardship, right? Uh, having folks like yourself, volunteers, cooperators, partners, to help us with that stewardship uh, of, of, of the land. And what's the future work that, that we're going to do? Well, I think, I think we're going to do that with open street maps, and I think we, we're going to be better off here uh, in the next five years. At least I, I, I certainly hope so. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, and then, um, and then I kind of dwelled there. I stopped on that. Just so you guys know, like, I ended up involved in this because, like, I email Gaia and I'm like, hey, this isn't a trail. I mean, I know it's a trail, but it's not a trail. It's it's not an official trail. It shouldn't be in the map like that. And then they sent me an e like a, an email back that just said, not like a personal one, like their form one that said like, oh, this isn't our data. It's like this thing called OSM. And I'm like, that thing in the base map of in Esri, like that. And uh, and then I was like, and they're like, oh, and you can go in and edit it. And I'm like. What? And I got a login, I edited it, and then somebody like in the community is like, hi. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's like people in here. <laughs> and uh and then I started and I'm like, I like, oh yeah, I just want this to kind of be different. And then um yeah, I started finding out what it is. Hey, it was really intimidating. Like I kind of do GIS, but like OpenStreetMap, as you guys know, is really different, like breaks my brain. And um and you know, and then got involved in the work group and found out like there's this whole community and blah, blah, blah. So, but I dwelled there because, you know, one of the ways we find out is like a person on the ground managing that land cares and they email one of the companies and that kind of comes back and, um, and then they're like, what's this thing? And they either engage or they don't because it is hard to engage. But like, we're really used to working with partners. Like ha who here has volunteered to do trail maintenance with like a partner? Yeah. like. We work with partners all the time to do like amazing things for trails and like OSM is a community of volunteers and you know, like 
we could be partners. Like we're used to that kind of relationship. So like I, I personally don't want to get an OSM and edit things as a federal employee. Um, but man, I like calling like is Jake here. Um, I sometimes I call there. I, I call Jake and I'm like, hey, there's this trail and I think it's tagged wrong. What do you think? And uh, so those relationships could get built and you know and that uh, concept of the um, digital trail. So yeah, ambassador. So um, anyways, maybe we can talk about that birds of feather more. But I just wanted to just for the community that's out there, just know that like there isn't really a big awareness yet of OpenStreetMap and that that's the data that like is behind a lot of the applications. Oh, and you get us really excited when you're like, oh, but if you do it here, it like goes across all the applications. Then it's like, oh my God, I don't have to talk to like the five companies that I know people are using like in our landscape. So uh, yeah, so I just wanted to stop there. And uh, so with that, before we pivot to something else, can any audience questions kind of so far like related to what we been kind of talking? I'll pause for an uncomfortable amount of time. I think this is relevant. Um, so let me see how to phrase this. The thing about OpenStreetMap is that people are going to map things. And that's the reason why people are so excited about it, is that they have this opportunity to contribute. And one of the one of the pieces that the Trails Working Group has been, I think, decently successful at is targeting those people who are interested in trails and communicating about the guidelines that the working group has identified that they should use when they're mapping. And one of the things was system versus non-system trail. Because that was one of the, the first, I would say, victories of the working group to be able to identify in areas of high use what the system trails were and what the social trails were. And some renderers, Gaia GPS, all trails, have changed the way they display those trails based on that information. So you're able to target a little bit. One of the things that's coming up a lot now that I've seen in the community is the question of off-trail travel and places that people go where there are no trails but that are known destinations like mountain peaks that have traverses or whatever. And I think what I'd like to know, it's really valuable to have people like you here to be able to help create maybe a set of guidelines for what's relevant in the management context for what someone does when they put those routes into OpenStreetMap. Because as we've talked about, like having a line on the map is very attractive to a recreationist. They say, oh, that's where I'm gonna go to get to the peak. Um, what sorts of information, as a, as a land manager, let's say you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with a recreationist, you would share with them about those kinds of, of dispersed routes, of off-trail routes, and how might you imagine encoding that, not in the technical sense, but what would you say OpenStreetMap should really be focused in on once those routes end up in there? And maybe what should be focused on? I'll just say I'm, I'm really glad I sat at the table with these guys for lunch because now I know what system versus non-system is because that, uh, that wasn't in my vocabulary before lunch, but now I understand where's I think for me, BLM designated versus non-designated trails. But um, so I think off the top of my head, one of the big things I saw being a, a backcountry ranger in, in Canyonlands and in Arches was just the, the safety component of it and knowing that people want to do these off-trail routes that you're talking about. I mean, it, and, and I agree with it, or I mean, that's what makes it fun, right? Like the Canyonlands of Southern Utah, it's fun because you can go off trail and you can go just create any route you want out there and at, at your own level of risk and, and desire for adventure. Um, where we were seeing it got problematic obviously was, um, you know, people were sharing that information but it looked like it was something that was within their capability when it really wasn't. So I think, you know, if people want to, put that information out and share it. There needs to be a way, and, and I think we're, we're already going down that road with, with the trail stewardship, stewardship initiative and um, tagging trails and, and data. Um, but there needs to be some way for people to understand exactly what they're getting into. Um, in particular, I think maybe even just something simple of just if you don't want to do something that's outside of you know just hiking on a, on a trail, don't look at this route, right? Because 
to some degree, people have to be responsible for their own level of risk and understanding and being able to read a map and know what contour lines look like and, and understanding like, well, if this route's going down these contours that are really, really close together, maybe it's not something I'm ready for. And um, But helping people who don't necessarily even have that level of discerning what that means understand what they're looking at. So. Um, I think that's a good place to start. Um, you know, that's just one piece of it, though, because I, I talked earlier about, you know, from a land management agency perspective of there's certain areas where maybe um, we don't want people to go um, for various reasons. So cultural resources, uh, areas of sensitive wildlife habitat and times during the year when areas um, are particular, wildlife's particularly particularly um, affected by or impacted by human presence. Um, so, you know, it's great people put these routes on there, but uh, when it's going into, say, uh, sensitive bighorn sheep lambing habitat during a season when they're very susceptible to disturbance and, and potential for, you know, impacts to lambing success, um, we need to be able to uh, have a way to help people understand that you know, you can go there and, and we don't want you to not experience this area, but there are reasons why we may not want you there. Um, and we're, why you, as a responsible recreationist, should be reconsidering going there. Um, so I think that's the, the link that somehow, you know, we need to figure that out, right? Like, being able to give people that opportunity to create these routes and share them with other people, but also consider the resources and, and the desires of a land management agency to do our jobs, which is, you know, multifaceted, right? It's not just about providing that visitor experience. It's about protecting the resources that are out there. So, so. kind of continuing on this thread, um, I'm thinking about the transition of, you know, when I was a kid, you stopped at the park ranger the visitor center and you got your intel, they assessed you know, oh yeah, you're not ready for this trail. Um, as we now have this digital divide between, you know, part of the community that grew up like me and aren't using apps, um, oh my God, I'm old. And it, then, you know, my kids, it, it's shifting the dynamic of the ranger's job. Um, and, and how do we transfer that knowledge that was at the visitor center to either through our maps or through other knowledge sharing ways so that, you know, parts of the ecosystem here get that intel and, and can give it to the customer where they're at. Because um, I know we can't do it, right? We're just, we're strapped too thin to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think you're hitting on it, Todd. I mean, that's, um, that's the, for me, the million dollar question of how do we, how do we, not only get that information out to people, but also help them understand why it's important. I mean, you heard Jordan this morning talking about um, just how the context of where a trail is is important, right? Because, um, you know, we may want to go and see these areas, but we also, as responsible recreationists and people using the land, need to understand what that means um, broadly as far as what impacts are out there and, and impacts to the things that we're going there to enjoy, right? Um, you know, it, it's very exciting to go out and see a desert bighorn sheep, and especially when you, in the back of your mind, know that this is a relict population that is the last remaining in Utah that, um, you know, existed here pre-human, um, or at least modern human habitation. Um, so, you know, how do, how do we get that information out to people? Because, you know, for us here talking right now, all we have is just a map, right? And and the information shared on a map can't necessarily express that. But if there's ways that we can, um, I mean, that's what we're trying to, to figure out. So um, it, it was interesting I'll, I'll to go off Tony and then also the, 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 um, what you were saying, Carrie. They, they felt like there was some terminology that was missed, some just commonality of language again, like that communication structure. Are we saying the same thing? Um, I think routes and trails become the interesting piece, right? Because when I was with Guy, when, um, we were talking about this uh, Wind River High Route or something of this nature. And I was, so Mary uh, was, was saying, we've got to take this off the map. It's not safe. And I was like, have you done it? She's like, well, yeah. I was like, 
well, then it should be mapped. It's doable, right? Like it's a route. It is a thing that you can accomplish out there. The question is, are we providing enough context, enough intelligence about that experience for an individual so they can make their own decisions out of it? Because again, the apps, you don't stop by the main station anymore, right? You just go right onto the trail. You just move forward and, and take on things on. So, and there's something there about like, what is the depth of information we need to provide to make sure that someone's, that it's someone that's safe? Um, and then also being sure that our words that we're using when we talk about mapping and trails and routes mean the same thing. So when we communicate private to public, public to the user base, we're all saying the same thing and not getting lost in language spaghetti. Yep, 100%. I mean, I think that's a, a big piece of it, right? Because we sit in this room and I'm listening to these conversations and we ourselves as people who are deeply involved all of this can't understand what the common terminology is. Um, and so if we can't understand it, you can imagine what the general public can't understand. So, um, yeah, I th and, and I don't mean to completely take over this, Larry, so if you need... <laughs> can, I, uh, can I just, this is just something for everybody to think about. Is this just an issue because of increased amount of users? Because paper maps never gave any context. I have had plenty of times where I followed a dotted line on a paper map and the trail was terrible overgrown or more adventurous than I expected. I, I saw it on the official US Forest Service map. I said, oh, I'm gonna go do that. And then I was like, this isn't a trail, you know, or this is way over my head or whatever. Is it just an issue now because number of people? Because we've been dealing with no context maps for generations. Well, I mean, of course, number of people is an issue, right? I mean, we, we can all recognize that the, the end, and it's an issue in the sense that it, it, it brings new complexity to managing land and recreation resources. I think it's not an issue in the sense that we want people to get outside and we want people to have access and to experience these places. Um, I think where I would say we're kind of going beyond that paper map piece is now this is being shared and there's the ability for people to add to that map. Whereas before you had a paper map, you only saw your edits to it, right? Like you're not seeing a, an international level of people contributing to this information and creating um, routes um, that aren't you know, necessarily designated or recognized by a land management agency. Um, so it, I, I think that's where the complexity comes in. Um, and, and I think as we talk, we're all recognizing that this is, it's very nuanced, right? There's not, there's so many different things coming into this that it's not, um, you know, like a, a black and white sort of like, well, here's the issue, um, let's solve this because there's many things that come into it. Yeah, and then can I just tag on too? Because um, I think one of the things that's changed and it, some of it's good too is that, you know, a lot of those, what we might call routes or, um, a lot of those destinations where there was no dotted line, but there was a trail there that existed that went somewhere you wanted to be, like that information was contained in communities that were usually in-person communities or someone told you about this guidebook and you went and found it from a bookstore. And so that limited access to like this small community and I think that less people went to those places at those times. Um, the skill to get there then was also higher because now you're navigating just the topographical lines to this thing that like maybe does have a trail that really exists in the real world that you're finding or doesn't. And so I think now in the new space, now we all in our pockets have that whole community with us. Um, we're not connected to them personally a lot of times now too. And then also now we follow our blue dot to that thing, you know, with a route that was drawn for us. And it, have you watched people follow the blue dot by the way? Like it's really interesting what people do on the landscape when the dot isn't where they think they should be. They'll like climb over boulders and logs doing a concentric circle trying to make the blue dot land back on the trail. Um, and it, like you'll watch them in a spot and watch repeated people do it over and over again. Um, so um, uh, come to the enchantments with me. I'll show you the spot. And um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I, I think that's 
I think something has changed. I don't think we know how it's changed. I don't think anyone studied it. I haven't seen a paper. If somebody has a paper on this, I really want to read it. I don't think we know how it changes when we map an area differently. Like when all of a sudden we map and add a lot of the trails that are really on the landscape that people didn't have access to before, how does that change the use pattern? I don't think anyone studied it. Like, um, so I think there's really interesting things going on. I think we see them anecdotally. Like, and our field staff that are on the ground enough see them anecdotally, but like quantitatively, we don't understand it. So like something's different, and we have a sense of it as land managers talking to each other, but man, it's really hard to put your f finger, it's nuanced, it's, yeah, it's hard. And uh, oh, the off-trail thing, I think we need a work group to like talk it through with a, with a rec ecologist, by the way. And uh, yeah, I think it's a really important thing to talk about, but I think you've had your hand up for a, a little bit, right? Um, do you want to, Diane, is that the order? Yeah, but I also, Larry, did you have anything you wanted oh, to yeah. say about this before we? Yeah, I think to Pitt's uh, point, um, you know, I, I got to Pleasant Grove, the Pleasant Grove Ranger District in 2003, and at that particular time, we had 50 inch or less ATVs, right? So all our gates, uh, that's how we built them. We allowed 50 inch or less after uh, after the season, and we closed down to, to uh, regular conventional uh, vehicles. We couldn't see what the future uh, was gonna bring us. Technology is just way ahead of us. We, we can't be proactive. We're always reactive. E-bikes, it's a huge issue right now. Um, and uh, for us in the Forest Service, they are considered a motorized vehicle, so that we don't allow them on any of our non-motorized trails. Now, are some of our ranger districts and forests out there uh, looking to convert some of those non-motorized trails to class one e-bike? Yeah, we're looking at it, but we have to go through the NEPA process, and uh, and they become uh, that can be uh, pretty uh, controversial. The Jackson Ranger District right now uh, is going through the process. They scoped it. I think they had 271 comments back, and uh, and it was pretty controversial on on both sides. So so they're they're working through that right right now. Um, when COVID hit, it just blew up. We, we had, uh, w there was no capacity at any of our parking lots, and I'm talking all 12 national forests, uh, and the photos that we saw of just vehicles just down, um, down, down the roadway parking, dispersed recreation uh, was just, we, we'd never seen anything like it. And so now that people know and understand what public lands are and what they can do, um, yeah, it's uh, it's we're we're never going to go back, and so the capacity that we don't have uh, on the ground, and the capacity that we don't have to actually help with uh, updating our data uh, is, is 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 pretty is pretty critical, and so I think this effort that we're going to be doing here in, in the future, I, I think, is really going to be helpful for us to 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 move forward. So my name is Derek Narenberg. I'm from Crested Butte, Colorado. And I had a little business that uh, fine mapped all the, all the public trails, system trails for our area. It was like over 1,500 miles, 2,000 miles of roads. And when I started that project, when, well, actually when I first got involved with OpenStreetMap, I was of the opinion if it existed, it should be mapped. But, and that was 2009. So now I'm a part of the Sustainable Tourism Outdoor Recreation Committee. And we're developing a tool called wildlife tools to see how wildlife um, migrates across the landscape and how it development impacts wildlife. In my opinion, it has changed quite a bit. I think land managers have a very important role to play in determining where people go in the landscape and very important management decisions to make. And the interface really is the maps. That's how more and more people are accessing the information. So I'm just curious, you know, what can people out who aren't a part of big companies and communities, how can they help improve the situation that's happening in areas where I, where I live? I feel like maybe I was part of the problem by mapping everything because now our community is just inundated with tourists and we're seeing the impacts and having to deal with them. So I don't definitely don't have all the answers, but what role do you, what, what can we do? What, how can we integrate with the land managers to help y'all get your information into the public's hands? 
So I would say reach out to your local ranger districts, at least for us, the Forest Service, right? Go to your local ranger districts. Find out, find out where, where they are at. They, they, are, they are willing and able to, to talk to you, to help you, uh, to uh, uh, have you understand what a motor vehicle use map is and how it's used, how it's utilized. Uh, do you want to volunteer for us? you want to go do some stewardship work for us? We'd love to, we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, we have external public uh, websites uh, that uh, you can you can uh, pull up the motor vehicle use map. You can uh, pull up our visitor use map uh, and, and see where those trails are, see where those trailheads are, uh, see where our roads are, where our developed campgrounds uh, are at. But uh, I would I would walk into your to your local uh, ranger district and or supervisor's office and go talk to the front desk people. That's what they're there for. Those frontliners are there to help you. Yeah, I mean, I think Larry's hitting on it. I think um, for me at the end of the day, it's partnerships, right? I mean, we've hit on it over and over again. It's land management agencies. We can't do this alone. And, and um, I'd go as far as even saying like the messaging itself, we're, we're just not doing it, right? We're, we can't, we're, we're not getting that information out there just um, pro primarily because of capacity, but the way we do it is through partnerships. And um, again, I, I talked a lot about um, my experience in Moab, which has been with um, Grand County primarily and, and um, forming that relationship between the Bureau of Land Management and, and the county to help us with that and to create and to work together to really create a level of desire and excitement from, from the county and the community to help support this and put on volunteer projects that can then help spread the word. Um, you know, I think um, I will say, you know, me personally coming into the my role with the BLM in Moab, uh, my my recreation experience up until that point where I moved over to the BLM was primarily um, non-motorized, um, mountain bike, hiking, trail running, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I found it has been really exciting to kind of take that step into this motorized world that's really popular in Moab and, um, you know, learning a lot about the motorized community and, and hopefully helping to connect with them to build that relationship of where we can start doing that as well and and you know i think there's challenges that come along with that and and um challenges that you know to some degree for those that have a, a us those of us on the ground are outside of our control but um you know helping to create those opportunities for partnerships and volunteer projects where you know we can at least be out on the ground and talk through these things and connect with each other and understand that we're all coming from you know, s similar desires for what we want to see happening out there. It's just, um, you know, making sure we can work together to do that. Um, I'll throw out a great example. I think, uh, you know, it, it, because recreation in, in Moab is very varied, um, we do have um, recreationists that uh, partake in aerial activities such as slacklining and rope swinging and um, anything in between that that you can imagine they're doing. Um, and we worked with them on an area where we're closing off a, or, or we've restricted use of some aerial stuff for the protecting of an important desert bighorn sheep habitat for lambing. Um, and, and the way we were helped to make that happen and to work together on it was um, some locals coming together to create what they're calling the Friends of the Fruit Bowl. So the Fruit Bowl is an area out there um, on the on the canyon rim that um, they like to do that activity and so you know it, it's I think that's for me on um, just sharing like it, it's hard right the, this is it's a it's a tricky relationship to develop with um, people in the area but it, it it takes a it takes all of us coming together as a community to create those relationships and to work together and it's something that I've definitely had to learn and to kind of grapple with as I've moved farther into my land management career. But um, so far, my experience in Moab is it's, we do what we do and we can't do what we need to do if we don't have those partnerships. Okay, so um, I just wanna add one thing and then we'll do the question and we're gonna go a little over. I was told I could go five minutes over. I, I've told you're all okay with that. So, um, okay. 
I just want to add, hey, there's one space where these conversations are happening, and that's the Trail Working Group, um, the Trail Stewardship Initiative hosted by OSM. And you know, to me, it's about responsible rendering of all the data that we have, you know, in order to um, give people good rec experiences, but um, and access and information, but also protect the resource. And you know, and it's important for everyone to participate, the agencies to participate, and like um, the app companies to participate, and the mapping community to in those conversations and. I think it's going to be about setting norms about like you know what's okay because those things that you might not do have business outcomes too. And so, anyways, I think that's one of the places. If there's other places to talk about it, tell me because I want to go. And um, and uh, yeah. So with that, uh, yeah, I'm the uh, supervisor of part of the AT Appalachian Trail uh, in New York, um, and it goes uh, uh, comes off the Bear Mountain Bridge and it. And up until about the 70s, it went straight up the hill. It's uh, 600 feet and less than a quarter mile. Uh, and some hand holds are required <laughs> occasionally, uh, unless you're much taller than I am. Uh, and But currently, there is no marking of that on OpenStreetMap and not of our local maps either. Uh, and the park, we've talked to the park manager, and he doesn't want that on there. But it's on the ground, it's partially blazed, uh, and uh, it sees probably 10 to 15 people a, a day on weekends going up it. Um, I think we need to do something to manage this better. Uh, the park manager doesn't want it on the maps, uh, but there's uh, a track on open street maps, I mean, on, on, uh, not on, on all trails, of somebody who lists that as an easy hike. <laughs> And uh, so, what, what's how should we how should we deal with this? Uh, I, possibly we need to take all the blazes off and put up some snow fence or something to keep them access to it. Yeah, Carrie, do you want me? To we usually, as feds, don't like when there's someone in another agency telling you something, like say something different. Uh, well, just usually, yeah. <laughs> um, there, hey, there is the SAC scale. Oh no way! There is hey, but there is the SAC scale, right? Making sure it's um, tagged appropriately with the SAC scale. If and if you have, I'm sure somebody in the mapping community can explain that. And uh, many of the apps are starting. Some of them render the SAC scale, right? Maybe I don't know. But yeah, do you guys want to? And we got about uh, one minute. I think the, <laughs> the the only thing I was going to add is just on you know the the question that comes to my mind is just understanding why the the park manager doesn't want that trail there and. And that's just a question I'm in my mind, right? Because I don't know that I have an answer for you other than just I need more information to understand um, the the situation in 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 um, full detail. So did you say six hundred feet and a quarter mile? Wow. <laughs> well, for for yeah, for for one, it's not sustainable, right? It, what is it? It's a cliff. Is there any op okay. I'm going to ask this question. It might be a really stupid question, but is there any opportunity to reroute it? The, AT, the, current, the real route of the AT goes a quarter mile along the road and then up the, up the hill on a sustainable route. Yeah. So I had a trail sort of, uh, sort of like that when I was on Pleasant Grove Ranger District, and, and I went and, and, and hiked it. Uh, and I had actually recreated there for, for many years, so I knew about this trail, and I was wondering why we, we didn't reroute it. So when I got there, I went out, and we, uh, we, we flagged some alignments. Uh, it was very steep. I was, I'm guessing it was a good 300 feet in, in a quarter mile as well. But, you know, it's not safe. It wasn't sustainable, and we, we were able to, to reroute it. So um, in your particular situation, I, I, I'd have to get on the ground to, 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 to really see it. I think Larry asked, if you fly him out there, he'll give you an opinion. That's what I heard. Um, OK, hey, with that, I think we are at time. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully, this felt meaningful, enjoyable. Hey, I do want to plug. There is a birds of a feather session. At, it's at 2, right? Um, kind of extending this and others. So yeah, come by that room if you like this conversation or some of them. Yeah, thanks, all.